What's up guys, I'm Salty Mike, and this is your Star Citizen Week in Review. Before we get started, I just want to welcome all the new subscribers to the channel. We've had quite a few over the last week, because basically our Star Citizen Week in Review did really well last week. I made some changes to the thumbnail and title and stuff, and it seems like we got some new people in here as well as some new subscribers. So welcome, we do this every week on Mondays, and I've been really enjoying doing them. Uh, it's, it's a really nice... Uh, thing to have to follow the development really closely it's it's helpful for me as well as um just really rewarding the feedback that i've been getting on them lately uh other things that went on this week we had an answer the call that was posted yesterday on the youtube channel and it was with detox detox is a twitch streamer who primarily streams star citizen and we discussed with him basically what he does to enjoy time with his org in star citizen today and it was a really nice conversation. It was one of my like highest viewed streams that we've ever had. The conversation conversation was great. Everybody was having a good time. So I really think you should guys you guys should go check that out. Now moving into the actual video, we usually start with patch notes, but since Star Citizen is prepping for 3.7, which seems like it can be any day in Evocati now, uh, there were no patches this week. So that's actually kind of exciting where normally it wouldn't be. Uh, so moving right into the roadmap updates, we had some changes and some positive ones. So FPS mining, harvestables, weapon attachments version 2, the Hedeby Salvo frag pistol, and the Kronag FL-33 laser cannon all went into polishing, which looks really promising for that 3.7 Evo Cotti patch coming soon. Most of the patch is now in the polishing phase, and that's usually where... Evocati gets it and helps polish it out. Uh, ship rental tasks were updated as well. Basically, last week they were one out of two, and now they're 13 out of 18. So all the tasks needed were updated in on their internal boards, I guess, and we got the 13 out of 18. That, that's what we can see visually. Uh, the Cutlass Blue moved from 3.8 to 3.9 because basically the Defender, uh, which is the Banu, first Banu ship, took too long. And they had to choose between the red and the blue, and they chose the red. Um, no real reasons were given why, but my guess would be because the red doesn't really have a different cockpit, where the Cutlass Blue has a totally separate cockpit from the standard Cutlass model. The whole sea was completely removed from the roadmap, uh, with all the same reasons that we haven't had it to date, which are mainly the moving physics grids. So this comes to no surprise to anyone following the project. Uh, that this isn't happening anytime soon. Ship-to-ship -ship docking also falls off the roadmap, with ship-to-station docking not coming online until 4.0. We'll get some reasoning behind this uh, when we go over Star Citizen Live a little bit later in the episode. The electronic sniper moves from 3.8 to 3.9, basically because the tech for the damage type, it's going to be a totally new damage type, won't be ready until then. I'm assuming that this damage type will also go for the electric shotgun as well. Uh, that was like the one of the first weapons in the game. Uh, and finally, mission givers, that they basically move to correspond with their landing zones. Uh, Bautista and Gibbs are Crusader mission givers, so they moved from 3.9 to 3, to 4.0 because Crusader moved to 4.0 last week, I believe. And Eddie Parr, who is a Microtech mission giver, is moving to 3.9, which is the second pass on Microtech. So this is an interesting and telling feature here. Uh, a feature change here because we expect Microtech at the end of the year, but it's looking like it's going to be a very early version of it potentially because version one isn't coming with a mission giver at all. So it's probably going to be really nice to look around, but won't be super functional until the first patch of the year in 3.9 in 2020. And moving on to video content, as always, we will start out with Inside Star Citizen. And today, we're going to do something a little bit different. The video was really long. It was about 15 minutes. But today, we're really only going to discuss the first section of it. The, the video was all about caves. But I think the most important part is what they're made of, what we're going to do inside them, things like that. And that was really in the first like kind of environment tech setup section of the video, where the rest of the video is more of like the sound design and how that was set up, the lighting and how that was set up. So I'm going to leave a link in the description. You guys can go check out the video on your own, and I highly suggest you do. But for today's discussion, we're going to do uh, we're going to break it down a little bit 
more compact than we normally would. Now, these caves have been on the roadmap for not a very long time, and they're moving along nicely, but we've been talking about them for like a year now, and they give a little insight on kind of what took so long. On the last um, Inside Star Citizen, we were showing the entire R&D phase that we have done. So since then, we have actually finished up all of our assets. Yeah, we've also involved all the other departments a bit more. We uh, are actually quite happy since all the building blocks are now in. We are now able to generate uh, a full cave. We had our caves being procedure generated by the layout tool, which is also used by the truck stops. And those truck stops, they float in space. They don't have the planet and the terrain as a context to them. So that's why it was tricky for us to embed these entrances as caves nicely on the terrain and, and have them generated so they, they don't you know, dip un, under the planet's surface and then uh, dip out again. That would be quite problematic. And a lot of that information we've already had, which is they used the procedural tech to make the stations and they repurposed it to make these caves. But it's interesting, a little discussion of, of how difficult it was and uh, why it kind of took so long. And obviously that they're built for space stations and not for planets. And speaking of planets, we're kind of waiting for the entire Stanton system to finish out with all of its planets. And one of the ways to do that is to kind of create as much gameplay on planets as possible and have what their kind of base version would be. And making caves is one of those things. And this clip gives some insight into that. The content that gets created by the layout tool needed more information in order to work with those caves. And since the caves have to be put on planets, we used the placement tool that has been used for the outposts before. We um, actually managed to make it work, and uh, now we are able to use the procedural layer tool together with the procedural placement tool on planets, which is a quite nice heads up thing for the future whenever we want to create more content. So just making the caves allowed them to repurpose tools that they were already using even more so they can repurpose them for future content later. Everything they're doing is to build out things as smoothly and as quickly as possible uh, obviously things are taking a long time with Star Citizen, but it seems like they're trying to do the right things to get us to have the most fun in the best looking game possible. And I think that's what a lot of us bought into. So, uh, this clip that, that just came up and we just watched really resonated with me and, and, uh, sticks out to me as something really important to share. Now, Obviously, these caves and this technology is really in its early stages, and caves in particular are in their first version. So they're not going to be filled with a ton of content, but they won't be empty either. The harvestables and mineables are scattered um, on tech points that are also procedurally scattered out in, in the caves. Um, so yeah, actually, it's not, not just going to be um, empty caves that you walk in and out, but there's actually things to find, stuff to do, right? Uh, resources together. We have this this very big nice to have list of ideas and elements yeah. definitely want to uh, tackle them in the future for sure because it's way too exciting stuff. And it's really nice to see that they have big plans for these caves. Uh, it's it's really important. Maybe caves in general aren't important, but exploration is what Star Citizen's all about. So exploring a cave just adds another layer on top of the the flying around in space, the walking around on a planet, and now kind of traversing a cave. It just adds to the Star Citizen experience, and it is kind of a given, I feel like, with a lot of what we see from other space games like No Man's Sky and, and the like today. So it just kind of makes sense, and it's, it's nice just playing and having other new experiences in the game. Uh, I get lost in ships, and I can't imagine how much I'm going to get lost in these caves, but they do seem to have a really good solution to help us with that, and this clip really gives you some insight into their ideas to help us walk around these caves a little bit easier. In the very first couple um, playtests, we realized that it was really difficult to tell 
where one should go, where you could climb onto and stuff like that. So we had to find a solution visually. And um, the solution for that actually was for us to add another element, which was like a little lichen layer on top of our rocks. And wherever that lichen is, we kind of try to navigate the player and lead the player towards um, the actual navigatable path. If we spent a lot of time walking through our own caves and um, I've got lost myself as well yeah. <laughs> many times. So maybe, maybe it will help with the orientation, you know, so, because then you, you get in and you don't get lost and maybe you can find your, yourself out. So make sure you keep this in mind, this lichen uh, feature in mind when you're going through the caves when 3.7 goes live or when you play it in the PTU. So this should help you get around and find your way through them. So I made sure that we put this in the video because honestly, I think this is probably the most important thing said in this video for the people who plan on playing 3.7. Now, moving on to Star Citizen Live, there was so much to share here. You guys know I love to make sure that we have a clip for everything we talk about in this show, but today's going to be a little bit different where uh, at the end, we're probably going to go through some bullet points because this was one of the best Star Citizen Lives to date where I, I felt like they hit some questions and had some answers to some really, really important topics. So starting out with uh, one of the more timely questions, which is about the 890 jump and its fuel consumption. People have been kind of freaking out on Reddit and making memes and stuff like that. So uh, the first question was obviously going to be related to that. So the, the 890 fuel consumption is definitely a bug in 3.6.2. It's fixed in 3.7. Uh, it's a combination of the fuel intakes not regenerating as much as they should have done and the thrusters using more than they should have done. It's really nice to hear that this is fixed and uh, it's going to give a chance for people to have some more fun and explore in their 890 jumps come 3.7. Uh, ship to ship docking. Now, we just talked about that earlier in our uh, roadmap update uh, discussion, and it's obviously going to be delayed. And here are some of the reasons why. Will the upcoming ship to ship docking feature include Constellation Snub docking or the Caterpillar's command section detaching? The um, Constellation Snub, it absolutely will. Um, the, the Caterpillar is will eventually but it's more difficult because um we have to effectively like disconnect disconnect the thing that controls the ship and then we like lose the control of this ship so it's not like two ships docking but it's more like a when, part of one ship, ship docking. splitting yeah yeah and getting that to work is a little bit more difficult so it seems to be moving around moving along really nicely and for whatever reason there the one part that he mentions is the ships like the caterpillar won't work with it and maybe that's why it's not ready for live yet. Maybe there's some big bugs with it, something. But we're not getting it. These are some of the reasons why. So it's nice to hear from the developers that work on these things as to why they're moving out of the roadmap. On top of this uh, roadmap update that we're getting each week from RSI, it's really nice to see uh, or to hear it as well. Now, we've all slammed into planets, flipped our ships over, and had roller coaster rides and hangers. And the big question is about proximity assist. Does it completely replace hover mode or what? Well, with the new stability assist feature coming online, uh, I believe we're calling it proximity assist, uh, coming online, how does it differ, improve upon hover mode? Uh, does it replace hover mode or is it meant to complement it? Um, it's meant to replace hover mode in the sense that it is going to closer to the goal that we wanted without sort of the sacrifices that we had to make with hover mode such that the VTOL animations that we currently have in hover mode where you go into hover mode and it will automatically play the VTOL animations that's now separated to a button that is a mode the VTOL thrusters rotate by themselves now or they rotate when you press the button and that's separated from proximity assist so you can have the, them rotated down without having proximity assist on and then when proximity assist is on um, you it's 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 quite a subtle um, system. Uh, it's very easy to forget that it's even there, which is how it's been designed. Mm -hmm. The idea is that as you're flying low to the ground and near stuff, um, the ship just controls nicer and more accurately. You can think of it like an assist, like it's just helping you fly uh, low and close to things without, uh, you know, flying around like you're um, a hummingbird or something, right? 
Like I stated last week, it certainly needs uh, some tweaking, but it was a bigger issue than just the controls. Basically, the way the game was built out just doesn't work with what hover mode was and this helicopter-like flying. So it just created more problems than just some tweaks. And uh, that's kind of unfortunate because I thought it could have been uh, really, really amazing. And I think that's why they tried to make it work in the last couple patches uh, because it, the the idea of it is awesome. It's just a lot more trouble than it's worth probably. And that's why they're going with this newer iteration of proximity assist. So they also said what they're moving towards is what their in real intent was in the first place, which is to kind of get away from this um, overpowered air to ground tactics, as well as this ridiculous hummingbird flying all over the place flight. And David kind of talks about that more here. So it's there's more. There's one thing I, I want to mention on top of that is that there's a piece as well that we haven't got in 3.7 that will also be coming to help replace what hover mode was, mm -hmm. which is the system where we are going to um, scale down the strength of thrusters in atmosphere. And what we can do with that is for ships, say, that have VTOL thrusters, we can set their efficiency curves such that they're barely able to hold themselves up in atmosphere unless they rotate their VTOL thrusters down. And so that is what gets us this, um, you know, not being able to hover on your end with a ship that has those rotating thrusters um, because it just, the, those front thrusters won't be strong enough in atmosphere to hold you up. So you have to rotate your thrusters down and then you have to kind of stay level. But yeah, that's an important component that I want to like, Make sure is is understood that that's also part of this um, because it may seem initially that we're making a backward step with taking out hover mode, but it's just us more carefully reevaluating it and getting closer to that goal that we originally wanted. Yeah, right? like I say, it, it will get us back to the goal of stopping ships moving around like right. hummingbirds, at, whilst also pointing nose down. So we've done the first bit, which will reduce the hummingbird stuff, and the next bit will be that so this is the real answer to is hover mode gone and it's not basically just the helicopter type flight version of it is and again like i said earlier that's something that i liked about about it and i thought it was a really cool feature but it, it's really about the goal of not feeling super weird and not realistic when you're flying near the surface as well as not being able to just point your nose down and shoot at ground targets super easily. And later, later on in the video, uh, there was a really, really important discussion about space combat balance and what their plans are for it. Are you currently happy with the current flight model? Um, so we're going to rebalance the ships for atmospheric flight, and then we are going to rebalance the ships for space flight combat as well. We're just taking a little bit of time to sort of solve some design problems with... Uh, combat that we not 100% sure we're going to do how we're going to proceed with that but once we're sort of more confident about that we will rebalance the accelerations as well there's more tweaking to do um i wouldn't say there's some huge fundamental no big thing not like the the change that we did with 35 to ISIS. there's nothing that level no it's planned. it's mostly um it's mostly balancing and uh, potentially some smaller mechanics changes to encourage certain types of combat yeah it, we want to get the combat closer rather than being pixel shooters and people fighting at above SEM speeds. But we want to keep the sort of the maneuverability that we have at the moment so you can dodge and maneuver and have positional combat, but at a shorter range. At, at slower speeds. At slower speeds. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious what some of these design changes that they want to make before they continue the balance on it is. Uh, since they don't really discuss them in the clip at all, they, and they didn't seem comfortable discussing any of those changes because they're probably not really sure about what they want to do just yet, um, but it's clear they want to slow us down in combat significantly, and they've been discussing this for a while. I think they just need to bring it down even more to be whatever flight they want. The big thing is, this may not be the flight that you want, this may not be the flight that I want, but regardless... Uh, the fact that they're paying attention to that it's not good yet, 
as long as we know that they're not happy with it yet and they're going to continue to work on it and they're going to continue to take at least some of our feedback about it uh i'm i'm still relatively comfort comfortable that we're going to have some sort of fun ship combat one of these days i i think the last few patches have it, this has been the biggest issue is that uh since the new flight model and gimbal assist and a, and a number of other changes has really brought the the in-game ship combat down to a level where it, it it's just not enjoyable and i think it's taken the fun out of the game for a lot of a lot of people for a while now so looking forward to seeing whatever balance changes come whenever they do come since there really wasn't any timeline on any of this stuff so now this is the section where we're going to go over just the remaining points that are left so i'm just going to kind of read through these bullet points and uh basically work went on to physicalize ship components somewhat uh at least so you can see them on your ship art wise and that happened during this quarter but there's no connections to the ship so the ship doesn't actually recognize that they're there and they're they're your ship components so your your ship components aren't actually in your ship yet where you can interact with them uh work needs to go on in future patches to get that going and then one of these days we'll be able to um have them damaged from some sort of combat or a crash or something and you'll be able to swap out components uh, work is also going on with auto gimbals to make them more intuitive, but that's not go coming in for 3.7. Uh, size 1 guns, I believe he mentioned this being a change in 3.7, which will break their rules completely. Basically, size 1 guns will be able to use auto gimbals, and uh, as most people who've played the game before know, that gimbaled weapons are only available, like gimbals are only available for a weapon size one lower than the mount but size one mounts are as low as it goes they kind of broke the rules a little bit here uh to allow for new players and basically new players to use auto gimbals which is kind of what they're for since they're uh basically an aiming assist and uh new players are going to need things like that to enjoy the game and then they'll be able to balance later on um fixed weapons and higher damage weapons and and higher size weapons uh for maybe more experienced and skillful players and i think this is a good move in in the right direction so we'll see how that goes and then uh further thought went into the customization of ships uh specifically with some of the newer uh and larger concept ships that are coming out in the future uh like the carrick they they were kind of concepted and are being worked on with the idea that they could get customization later on instead of having to retrofit customization into them uh, after they've already come out. This is interesting because I would expect all ships to have customization on them, but it's nice to see that they're not going to slow down the pace of a ship coming into the game just so they can sell coffee machines on them. So uh, I believe that one day our ships will be completely customizable. All of our ships will be, but I think that's something for the beta phase of Star Citizen, the, the the polishing phase of the game as a whole, bringing that element in. And after things like ship sales are kind of moving and on their way out, this is the way to kind of monetize the game in the future. ESP is still being adjusted, uh, but there was a lot of talk about fixing all of the issues around it instead of ESP as an algorithm being the problem. It was more of the information that was coming into it that was corrupted in some way because of server degradation or uh, whatever. They they gave a number of reasons here uh, as to why, but they seem to think that ESP is relatively decent, but they also mentioned the fact that they've kind of um, focused more on the smoothing uh, aspect of ESP and less of the auto-aim aspect of it. So hopefully it gets a little bit better. Now, moving on to the end of the video, our miscellaneous stuff. We had a Banu Defender sneak peek. It looks like a crab, <laughs> but it looks really interesting. And it seems that they've probably um, solved the issue with the arms being in the way of the cockpit quite a bit. So looking forward to seeing that ship in the game soon. As well as some new sub flare, which is kind of interesting. I'm really kind of curious what you guys think about these. I don't think they look good at all really personally i'm i'm not a big fan of them but
But uh, set one is if you're a 10 or a $20 subscriber, you get this set here. And then set two is only if you're a $20 subscriber. So if you're just subscribed for $10, you would have to purchase this on this exclusive subscriber store. And then set three is only purchasable on the subscriber store. And I think the reason they chose these colors is, well, the left one looks awesome. And the right one is an easy sell to everyone in Test Squadron. So good job, CIG, on that one. They're, they're going to make plenty of money on that yellow and black scheme. They also have this weird coming soon post that came out when I first started working on this video today. And I wouldn't think too much about it. Uh, Reddit, Reddit has been kind of freaking out, and they zoomed in on something that looks like a new ship of some sort. And in my experience, they really only bait the community on ship sales. They don't really bait and try to pull you in for any sort of like gameplay feature that's coming out that they didn't want to talk about. So um, most likely this is whatever that RSI ship sale um, that was kind of teased last week is about. So that is going to do it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. And again, thank you for all the feedback you guys have been giving over the weeks. And specifically last week, it was, it was really positive. And welcome again to all the new subscribers to the channel. If you aren't a subscriber yet, maybe consider it and uh, hit that subscribe button. Hit the like button if you like the video and leave a comment below on anything we talked about today. I'm really interested in your thoughts about what happened this week in Star Citizen. So I will catch you guys in the next video. Everybody have a great day.